Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. Uh, hi, I'm Tim Merrill from DG Capital. Um, the stuff we're going to go through this morning uh, is extracted from our mobile internet games and augmented and virtual reality reports. So we advise mobile, AR, VR, and games companies in America, China, Japan, South Korea, and Europe. And we do three basic things. Investment banking, so buying and selling companies. Management consulting, mainly strategy work for companies that want to grow faster, or for large companies that want to invest in new sectors or new geographies. And lastly, industry analysis. And that's what we're going to go through today. If you look at where the industry is, you see that the larger players are now very much in control of where things are going. Uh, look at, say, the um, uh, top grossing charts in relation to mobile um, anywhere in the world, and they're pretty stable. There's not a lot of movement. And what we're seeing is that growth has stabilized and slowed at an overall industry level. So it means that if you're one of the big guys, you're in a great place. If you aren't, life is becoming a little bit harder. In terms of revenue, uh, we forecast that it will grow from $88 billion this year for the industry as a whole, in terms of software, to $110 billion by 2018. Now, that sounds great, you know, going over $100 billion for the first time is very exciting. When you look within the numbers, you see a slightly changing picture from what we've had in the last few years. That growth rate is around 8% year on year, so it's single-digit growth. And the change from double-digit growth, where things are going like this, to single-digit growth, where things are slowing, means you get a bunch of different dynamics. You get the big players who've got the franchises who can afford to invest in advertising and marketing. So basically, acquiring users are spending that money to maintain their positions. If you're an indie or a mid-tier company, it's harder to break through because you're competing against a more stable environment. Now, if you look within the overall revenue picture, what you see is that uh, this year, mobile will be roughly similar to online and console in terms of revenue. So they're splitting it roughly equally. But going forward, because mobile is the highest growth st space still, um, apart from AR and VR, which I'll come back to, uh, it's going to increase its overall share of the total pie. So let's look within mobile and look at the, what's happening with revenue there. And there we forecast it growing from 29 billion this year to 45 billion by 2018. And as has been the case since around 2013, Asia, driven by China, Japan, and South Korea, dominates mobile games revenue then followed by North America, Europe, and the other markets. So thinking a little bit about Asia and how that changes things, and again, drilling down in mobile, the accepted wisdom, which nobody would argue with, is that uh, Google Play has far more downloads than iOS. So you know, no nothing new there. But if you take into account the giant Chinese app stores, so Baidu, Chihu, Tencent, Wanduja, and others, what you see is that iOS and Android, as iOS and Google Play at an overall level are actually in the minority of downloads globally. But it's not just about downloads, it's also about revenue. Now, again, the accepted wisdom is that iOS makes a lot more money than Google Play, and nobody would argue with that. When you factor in the Chinese app stores, what you find is that by 2018, in terms of the forecast that we've put together, that Android will actually outweigh iOS for games revenue, in other words, Games developers globally will be making more money from Android than they will from iOS. That's quite a different picture to, which, to what people normally see. So iOS will still remain the largest single app store, but Android as a whole will become larger. But it's not just about raw numbers. You have to look within what's going on in the market and look at the trade-off between value, in other words, how much money you're making, and volume uh, in terms of the number of downloads you need to make that money. And what you see is a fairly clear distinction between value and volume markets. So the value volume index here is looking at how many downloads you need to get in any app store to make the same amount of money as you make from one iOS download. And so what you see is that on Google Play, you need around a bit, a bit over two times the number of downloads to make the same amount of money as a single download from iOS. And in China, it's over eight times. So broadly speaking, iOS, it's a true value market. That's where the highest revenue per download is to be found. And it's a good place to operate. That's why so many mobile games companies uh, focus very heavily on iOS. Google Play, it's a hybrid, uh, a mixed um, value and volume market where you can still make good revenue, 
but you need to get a lot more downloads to do it. And China is a pure volume market. Essentially, if you don't have the distribution relationships with Baidu, Tencent, Chihu, and others, it's very hard to make any sort of impact from a revenue perspective there. You've got to get to high downloads, which means you have to have distribution relationships. The trade-off against those distribution relationships is that there's money that you've got to pay on the way through. In other words, with iOS and Google Play, it's 30%, you're done. With the distribution relationships, there's another handout between you and your ultimate user. So you have to get to high volumes, but you'll actually see less of your own turnover as revenue. Now, it's, it's a great thing to do if you can achieve it, but you need to be mindful of the need to have those relationships and the trade-offs from a, money, a revenue point of view that you have to make. Now, let's move on to probably what's the most exciting part of the market, which is augmented and virtual reality. There are a lot of players already, even before the market's launched properly next year. So on the AR side, you've got ODG, Magic Leap, Microsoft, Meta, Apple bought Mattia recently, although they haven't said what they're going to do overall, uh, and then a range of other players. Looking at the VR side, there's Facebook with Oculus, HTC Vive, Sony with Morpheus, Razer with EOS VR, Samsung with a Gear VR, uh, and so on. So there are lots of different players, and it's fantastic because it's such an early stage market. But the thing to keep in mind is that pretty much every single player here is doing things differently. So it's not a homogenous market in the way that, say, iOS or Google Play are. They're, they're different sorts of markets, but hugely exciting. But there's a big difference between the two in terms of, of what you do and, and how you do it. Put simply, VR is taking the user and immersing them inside a virtual world. It's placing them in the virtual world. They can't see out of it. AR is something you can see through and around. It's basically placing virtual objects into the user's real world. It's a very different sort of dynamic. From a, a, a game's perspective, VR is a lot more fun. It, it's fully immersive. For those of you who've had a chance to play around with what, what you can do with Oculus, with HTC Vive and so on, they're amazing experiences. They, um, they give you that feeling you had when you were eight years old, you'd just been to the beach and you had too many ice creams and you were full of sugar. It's fantastic. It's a wonderful experience. AR is not as much fun for immersive games because they're not as immersive. But that p potential limitation for games, that potential weakness for games, actually makes them much more versatile, a much more general computing device, and therefore a much broader set of use cases. So where can you use the two of these things? VR, you need to be in a stable environment. You need to be you know, in your home, your office, a train, a plane, basically somewhere where you're not going to get knocked down by a truck because you can't see out, out the side and you can't see out the front. You can't walk down the street wearing a, a sort of a VR headset. It's just not going to work. AR can you be used pretty much anywhere. Anywhere you can walk, run, drive, climb, fly in space. There are actually, being, there are actually experiments going on with ODG and now Microsoft uh, with NASA for the International Space Station. So in space, you can use these things. The fact that you can look through it and around it means you can use it pretty much anywhere. So which markets are AR and VR cannibalizing and growing? And this is where it starts to become very important for games developers in terms of thinking about which markets you focus on and where the opportunity is. VR is broadly going to cannibalize and grow console and PC games. That's the largest part of the market it's going to impact initially and going forward. Then 3D films, and lastly, some niche enterprise users. So when you think about the installed base that you'll end up with in, for VR, it'll be in the tens of millions of units. So a great market, a deep market, but in the tens of millions. AR, different kettle of fish altogether. You're talking about it cannibalizing and growing the smartphone and tablet market. So ending up with hundreds of millions of users. So a very different scale, different set of use cases, and for games developers, a very different way to think about the two markets. So what are the addressable markets for these two things? Well, with VR, um, I was talking with Tommy Palm uh, about his new company, Resolution Games, uh, the other day. And if you think about games developers, VR is the place to be. Far and away, it's the way that the systems are being marketed. If you look at the early dis discussions from Oculus, from HTC, from Sony, from others, they're very much pushing it as a, a unified games positioning. I think they've learned the lessons from what happened with the previous few console generations in terms of positioning as games machines versus general entertainment uh, devices. And they're, so far, early market, it's very much being pushed as a games market. Then you've got 3D films, um, and we've spoken with pretty much every Hollywood studio in the last few months about what they're doing, and that's a very strong pu push from the industry coming out of Hollywood. Then you have the niche enterprise users, 
uh, military, medical, education. Um, and so that's what VR is good for. That's what it's going to be used for. When you look over at AR, very much broader set of use cases, more general use cases. So shopping, phone calls, browsing the web, uh, TV and film, probably not 3D, but just straight streaming video, straight t 2D video. Enterprise users, business users across the piece. And then as that market starts to get to the hundreds of millions of users, advertising. You basically, the big brands are already experimenting and more come on board as the overall user base grows. Then you move into the consumer apps from Facebook to Uber to Clash of Clans. And then lastly, theme parks where it's already being experimented with. So let's look at the money side of things. What are the forecasts? Now, based on the difference between the two markets, where again, VR, tens of millions of users, AR, hundreds of millions of users, you get a very different picture going forward. In the early market, next year when the market launches, 2017, VR will be taking the lion's share of revenue. But from, from 2018, when the AR market starts to ramp, and there are a whole bunch of technology reasons uh, and various other development reasons why it's going to take until then to get going, then we expect AR to accelerate much faster than VR. And overall, by 2020, uh, we anticipate AR taking 80% of the market, and a market in the 100, 150 billion range in terms of revenue. Now, coming back to what that looks like for games developers, it's important to think about where you focus going forward. So I'll start with VR, uh, the smaller of the two markets, but still a substantial market, around 30 billion. By far the largest part of the market we anticipate by 2020 is games. So if you're a games developer and you're thinking about aiming at a growth market, how you raise money, when you're going to sell, all these different things, VR is the place to be. It's going to be the largest games market in terms of, of these two markets. Then hardware, film, uh, the theme park market, and then the niche enterprise market. But again, we expect enterprise and industrial uses to go a lot more towards AR than VR. So let's go across to AR, because here it's a different picture from a game developer's perspective because of the broader set of use cases. The largest part of the market, hardware, by a long stretch, then followed by e-commerce, so Alibaba and Amazon selling things to people in totally new ways. Then the data and voice revenues to the telcos, uh, moving on to film and TV um, uh, for the, the Hollywood studios. Then moving into enterprise AR, lots of different verticals, whether it be finance or architecture or construction, a whole range of different uses. Then moving into ad spend, the broad set of consumer apps, and then into games. So in terms of, of the way that we've looked at the market, we don't see the AR games market being anything like the scale of the VR games market. So again, if you're thinking about developing, raising money, exit in games, in this market, VR over AR. And then lastly, the theme park piece. Now, that's all the good stuff, what's been going well, where things are going to be growing, all the opportunity. Let's look at a, perhaps not quite as rosy a picture. Um, now, last year was a record year for games, M&A, um, uh, and IPOs. If you look at M&A and IPOs combined, there were $24 billion worth of deals last year. It far outstripped anything that the market had seen before. There were five mega deals uh, over, the, over the billion dollar mark, you know, things like Oculus, or what, there was Twitch, a whole range of, of larger deals. So last year was amazing. This year is a completely different picture. So coming back to that stable growth that I was talking about, it's had a pr profound impact on acquirers of games companies, on investors in games companies. Broadly speaking, the total deal value, so not volume, this is total dollar amount, of deals in the first half of the year dropped 89%. So it's at a, a tenth of what it was uh, last year, an extraordinary drop. Now, 87% of that drop was M&A. So the, the acquirer's market has dropped substantially as that substantial growth has, as that, the huge growth we have has stabilized to stable growth. And from the investment point of view, it's the market's dropped by half. So if you're trying to raise funds at the moment, Already, the market had narrowed to small, specific pools of investors. It's a lot harder to raise money now than it was last year. So what does all this mean? I mean, there are lots of numbers, and you could see really a you know, not pretty picture here. You've got to think about the different players at the different levels. And I'll start at the top end with the, the guys we looked at up front, who basically the, the guys who are dominating the industry and should continue to dominate for a while. The corporates have got hit IP. So they've got IP that's out there that's doing well. They're in the top charts. They've got user scale already. They've got the infrastructure to do everything they need from user acquisition to UA to testing to everything they might want. They've got a lot of cash flow. So they've got the money to be able to reinvest in their businesses. Now, they don't have low costs. 
because well, they're big, they've got a lot of mouths to feed, they've got the scale and the infrastructure. So they have to keep on feeding that, which means they have to avoid risk. They also have as much chance as anybody else of getting a hit, which you know, it's a hit-driven industry, you can't avoid that. Um, anybody can have a hit. There's, there's no, anybody who thinks they can pick one before it actually gets launched doesn't know what they're talking about. Then let's go to the little guys at the bottom, the indies. Now, they haven't got any of the advantages. They don't have um, a hit IP, they don't have user scale, they've got no infrastructure, they don't have the cash flow, but they don't have the costs. So from a financial perspective, they don't have the risk, which is great. So indies are doing what indies have always done, which is basically try and produce absolutely wonderful games, delight people, and if they get lucky, get a hit, and then go up the chain. The difficult market, the big squeeze that we're seeing at the moment is on the middle, where if you're a mid-tier game developer, you've kind of got the worst of both worlds. You don't have hit IP. You don't have user scale. You've got infrastructure. In other words, you have a lot of mouths to feed, but you don't have high cash flow to support that. Uh, you also don't have the low cost that an indie has. Now, again, any of these different types of companies all have exactly the same chance of getting a hit game. You know, look at Crossy Road. Those guys did amazingly well out of nowhere with two guys. Fantastic. So, you know, look at um, uh, any of the recent, recent hits. I mean, it's, it's possible to even look at Flappy Bird came out of nowhere. So you can get a hit from anywhere. But there's, in, if you're thinking about the risk profile, it's changed the behavior for acquirers and investors. So broadly, what we see as being the next, next steps that are happening in the market, at the big end, uh, basically, folks are trying to cut their costs. So one thing that we're not seeing as much anymore as we saw for when the market was very hot and growing very quickly, we're not seeing team buys so much. In other words, people are trying to manage their own costs. The last thing they want to do is come in and buy your costs to add to their own. They're buying guys who've got IP that hasn't been monetized well enough, or guys where they're starting to ramp up very quickly and where they can accelerate. Back down at the indie stage, again, doing what indies have always done, you know, becoming really great. That's the point. The, the, if you're an indie, you're doing it because it's a vocation. You love it. You're not doing it because you expect to, to go and live on the beach. You're doing it because you're absolutely passionate about games. And that's what indies have always done. It's what indies should always do. In the middle, the only real option that we see in this market is to slim down. Because if you're in the middle, it's a tough place to be. You're not going to get acquired in this sort of market. You're unlikely to attract investment. So your only way to survive this is to operate your way through it. And that's to basically focus on what you're good at, try and improve it, try to actually rise up the stack, but look at your business very realistically in terms of the overall economics. So that's the, the, the talking bit done. Um, if, if you, I know I went through things fairly quickly. Go to the website. All that stuff's sitting there. Feel free to go and have a look, uh, find what's interesting to you. Um, uh, and thank you very much. You've been a very kind audience. Thank you. Are there, are there any questions? Before yeah, I, I we have uh, about five minutes for questions. Uh, anyone want to start off? Yep. Hey, uh, w what would be the size difference that you would differentiate between the slim down indie and the, the, the mid level? Um, uh, slim down indie, you're eating ramen. Um, uh, slim down uh, uh, mid tier, you're not. It's, it's basically, it, uh, indies are, you know, it might be one, two guys, might be five guys, it's, you know, it's small. Mid tier is, you've got some games out there and you're doing okay. You, know, you might have five, 10, 20 guys, more. But you're, you've got an office, you know, you, you're, you basically, you've got homes, you've got mortgages, you, you're not 20. Um, it's, it's, we don't sort of have a cutoff point, but it's basically, you know an indie when you see one. Um, you know a, a mid-tier company because it looks like a company, if that makes any sense. Anyone else? Oh, uh, the question was uh, why have, um, investment in M&A deals declined so much this year. Um, it's because of that change to stable growth. Um, when the market was growing you know, double digits across the board in terms of the online and mobile spaces, um, everybody was going as fast as they could to try and do a land grab. They, you know, people needed money to grow and VCs to a degree, although you know, specific VCs, strategics, were investing into the market. For acquirers, they had margins that were either stable or growing. When you get stable growth like what we're seeing in the market at the moment, it means that everybody's spending more money on things like user acquisition. So it squeezes the top guy's margins, squeezes everybody else's margins. So there isn't as much money to throw around. The, the other thing that goes with that is when, when you look at the public companies in terms of multiples at the moment, they've also come off a bit. You know, there's the excitement about the opportunity in some of the, the different companies in the public space. And again, 
it varies. If you look, say, in the Chinese market, there are some companies with, with very, very high valuation multiples, but there isn't as much paper value floating around. So ultimately, when growth slows, it slows everything else, things stabilize. Folks are just a lot more careful with their money. And also, from the VC community who are already challenging to raise money for a games company, um, in this sort of market, they don't see something going like that. So again, AR and VR could be a breakout. And, and, and you know, that's a, I'd say that's a different market. And so there are folks in games who are able to raise money in that space. But everything else is stable. And so it's, the, it's that stability that's really pushed things down. There's just, there isn't the, the, there isn't the growth, to the high, really high growth, the double digit growth, to support high levels of investment and high levels of acquisition. There's somebody else down, down the back as well? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can we get you on the mic so we can have everything recorded? Thank you. Um, you talk about um, Asia market, Europe, Europe market, in, in the US market. How do you see the future of Latin America market that is um, growing like two digits very fast yeah. in the future of a mobile games. Yeah, I think Latin American market's a great market, um, uh, and I think I think it's got huge advantages if you are local. In other words, if you're trying to operate in the Latin American market with your team based um, in the States or Europe or other really high cost markets, then I think it's it's tough. I mean, you, you can do stuff, there, and we know some, know some teams that do that exactly that. If you're local and you've got local costs and you're bringing in local revenues, so that so you can match that so you're actually profitable, good market growing quickly. It doesn't have the same scale as, the, as China, Japan, Korea, the US, US market, some of the big European markets, but, it, but it's still good market. And again, when I say scale, I mean from a revenue perspective. From a user perspective, obviously huge, massive, very exciting. So, so long as your cost base is reasonable, good place to be. Right, down the front. One, one last question, if we could. You talked about two location-based VR opportunities in the uh, theme parks and the movie industry. I'm assuming the movie was in venue or was it for home as well as a theme park. Can you elaborate on what you're hearing about the use cases? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you see a really interesting dynamic going on in Hollywood at the moment around the, around the film side. We've spoken to guys where the CEO absolutely believes in this stuff and they've got a dedicated AR and VR lab with every single bit of kit you could possibly find, and they bring in the big blockbuster directors, because these guys only do blockbusters, to come and play with it and learn how it's gonna work, to figure out how to tell a story in a non-linear medium. You know, if you think about uh, the way that you tell a story in the way that currently cinematic, cinematic VR works, it's a little bit like being on, on a, a theme park ride, because you've got one spot where you know, the user can look around, then you get moved to another spot to avoid motion sickness rather than the transition. And so, the director isn't telling you where to look, but they are determining where you're looking from. Going forward, that's going to change. So if you look at folks like, say, Otoy, actually they already have the technology to be able to have you actually move through a cinematic scene and have it work. So we're seeing guys where they're very focused. On the other side, we're seeing large media conglomerates where they've got 30 guys in a room, all of whom are really fascinated by AR and VR and they see the possibilities, but they don't have any experience yet, so they haven't quite figured out how to tackle it. Um, I think for Hollywood, it's a qu and, and, actually, and for games developers, it's the same thing. It's a question of installed base. You know, looking at next year, going to 2017, the installed base is still going to be relatively contained. It's really, it's a longer term proposition from a revenue perspective. So there are other ways they're looking about it around the marketing side. Look at, say, um, oh, some of the recent films where they've actually done VR experiences. It's being used for that sort of thing at the moment. It will eventually be used for, for short form and then long form content. Thank you very much. <laughs>